This morning, I have the privilege of, of introducing uh, Scott Minnick, uh, Associate Professor of Microbiology from the University of Idaho. Uh, Professor Minnick received his PhD from Iowa State University in Microbiology, and after doing some postdoc positions at Purdue and Princeton, and a teaching position at Tulane, he uh, finally accepted his present position at the University of Idaho. Uh, interesting little note, he also has worked on developing uh, in a uh, work position that he had uh, some rapid diagnostic procedures for infectious agents. And um, th I think that's part of what's led him into being asked to go to Iraq next year um, as part of an inspection team. So uh, we're lucky we still got him. He's running back and forth across the country right now. And, and, um, uh, but they allowed him to come here. So. <laughs> Uh, today, uh, Scott will take a critical look at an irreducible complexity in nature, and in particular, the E. coli bacterium, which turns out to be an incredible work of creation. We'll also show the difficulties of trying to fit the development of such an organism into a classical Darwinian evolutionary scheme. Uh, these ideas will be explored further in a panel discussion following his talk, uh, led by Art Batson. Um, let us welcome uh, Professor Minnick. Well, thank you for the invitation to come and speak at this symposium. Um, it's a real honor. I um, believe that, you know, if you look at the hierarchy of the sciences, you have to put philosophy on the top, physics and mathematics um, next, and then, you know, biology and chemistry follow in the wake. We are dependent upon the physicists to direct us and, and provide us the technology that we need. But anyway, I want to talk about the bacterial flagellum. Part of this will be very specific, um, more than you want to know, but just to give you an idea that I, this is an active area of research I've been involved in. Uh, a little bit with E. coli, more with a, a relative of the, in the genus Yersinia, but it's the same, essentially the same system. I think it's important because the bacterial flagellum has been kind of the mascot of the intelligent design community in terms of looking at irreducible complexity. And there is another system that has some similarities to the flagellum, we call them type 3 secretion systems that I also work actively on and um, when this similarity was recognized, people like Ken Miller at Brown said, well, here's your intermediate, um, here's how you can explain irreducible complexity from a Darwinian standpoint. And Ken doesn't work on these systems. Um, I think it poses more problems for a Darwinian position and I'll, I'll give you my thoughts on that. But I want to start first by um, more waxing more philosophical. You know, I'm, I'm in the biological sciences, and the position that I take is more or less heretical. Uh, we don't talk about God when we give lectures. Uh, that's strang verboten. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's important that we look at the issues and not forget the heritage of of where we're coming from. But I have a couple quotes that, you know, if you're a, a student in the biological sciences, you're going to run into. And they can have, uh, you know, cause you to pause and think about it. Now, the first one's from Jim Watson, Nobel laureate on the structure of DNA. We're celebrating the 50th anniversary this year. In his first edition of the Molecular Biology, Biology of the Gene, which has gone through numerous um, editions, was used as a standard textbook. Um, I used it as an undergraduate student. We used it as a graduate student, and I even used it when I was teaching uh, in the late 80s. But in the first chapter, really on the first page, he makes a statement, today evolution is an accepted fact for everyone but a fundamentalist minority whose objections are based not on reasoning but on doctrinaire adherence to religious principles. Okay, and then many of us are familiar with Richard Dawkins from Great Britain and his book, The Blind Watchmaker, 
Um, he starts out, although atheism might have been logically tenable before Darwin, Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. Okay, and then whenever these debates come up um, in the school systems in Kansas and Ohio, you will see uh, Dobzhansky's quote bantered about, the last one, 